In this part of the video, I'll explain how t-tests actually work, starting with the one-sample t-test. The one-sample t-test compares a sample mean to its value under the null hypothesis and then divides it by the standard error. The value under the null hypothesis can be whatever you want it to be. So if we want to know whether men are significantly taller than 1.8 meters, then mu0 is 1.8. And if we want to know whether body temperature in a class differs from 37 degrees Celsius on average, then mu0 is 37. Using the same example I've shown you before, a one sample t-test can be used to answer the question, is the mean height of these men significantly more than 1.8 meters? The null hypothesis is then that it is less than or equal to 1.8 meters, and once we stop believing in the null hypothesis, we accept the alternative that the mean must be greater than 1.8 meters. We calculate the average height of these individuals, and again it turns out to be around 1.85, and we can start filling in some values. If you recall, the formula for the one-sided t-test is the sample mean minus the value under the null hypothesis divided by the standard error. We already have two of these values, namely the sample mean of 1.85, and we have the null hypothesis that it should be 1.8. The last thing is then the standard error, which is equal to the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. What does the standard error actually tell us? The standard error is a measure of uncertainty. In the numerator, we have the standard deviation, which is the extent to which observations differ from the mean. If this value is large, then the uncertainty is also large. In the denominator, we have the square root of the sample size. And if we divide by a small number, so if the sample size is small, then the uncertainty is also large. We calculate the t-value by dividing by the standard error, so that means that the greater the uncertainty, the lower the t-value and the weaker our evidence against the null hypothesis. And if we have a very large sample size, or if the standard deviation is simply small, then we have less uncertainty and we have stronger evidence against the null hypothesis. If you want to calculate the standard error, first you have to calculate the variance. For this we're using the unbiased estimator of the variance, which takes the sum of the squared differences from the mean and divides it by n minus 1. n is the sample size, and we subtract 1 because in this unbiased estimator we account for the fact that we already use these data to calculate the mean. So we don't have the actual mean, we only have the sample mean. So we subtract 1 to indicate that we already use some of the data and we end up with an unbiased estimator. The sample standard deviation is then simply the square root of this, and the standard error is this square root of the variance divided by the square root of the sample size. Finally, we can calculate the t-value by filling in each of the values that we computed so far, and we end up with a t-value of about 1.585. But what does this value tell us? Recall that the t-test starts by assuming that the null hypothesis is actually true. But even if the null hypothesis is true, it only counts for the population. In other words, if we assume that men are on average 1.8 meters, then even if that is true in the population, when we draw a sample, we will observe a small difference in the sample mean. So here is then the probability distribution of t-values if the null hypothesis were actually true. I've chosen five degrees of freedom here because we had six observations and we calculated one value, namely the sample mean, and then five degrees of freedom are left. The proportion of this t distribution from our calculated t value onwards then gives us the p value. This is the surface area under this distribution, and it turns out to be 8.7%. What that means is that even if the population of male students had an average height of 1.8 meters, there would still be an 8.7% chance of drawing a sample that yields a t-value of this large or even larger. Remember that a sample is a random subset of the population, and therefore it will always differ somewhat in its sample mean from the population. So if the null hypothesis were true, and you were to draw a sample from the population, then this curve shows how likely it is for the t-value to be as extreme as yours. This 8.7% is the p-value. And if this p-value is lower than the chosen level of significance alpha, 
Then we reject the null hypothesis and say that there is a significant difference. For example, with alpha equal to 0 0.05, we would conclude that there is insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis because our p-value is larger than 0 0.05. You have to choose this level of significance before you start your study or experiment. It is the acceptable chance of a false positive. So if you choose 0.05 as is common in biology, that implies that you find a 1 in 20 chance of a false positive to be acceptable. In other words, you find it acceptable that there is a 5% chance that your p-value will be significant even though there is no difference in the population. What if the t-value were larger, say 3? Then very simple, it would encompass a smaller percentage of the total surface area, in this case 1.5%. In that case, if we have the same alpha of 0.05, we would reject the null hypothesis because the p-value is smaller than the chosen level of significance. The t-value can also be negative, so what if it were a minus 3? In this case, if we ask the same question, are men larger than 1.8 meters, then what we're really asking is what is the chance of observing a t-value that is larger than minus 3? This encompasses most of the probability distribution, 98.5%. So for any justifiable choice of alpha, we would not reject the null hypothesis in this case. Quick question then. If the t-value were 0, what would the p-value be? You can pause the video if you want, and I'll reveal the answer on the next slide. The answer is 50%, because the t-distribution is symmetric. What it really means is if the null hypothesis were true, what is the chance of observing a positive t-value? And in a symmetric distribution, the chance of a positive result is as large as the chance of a negative result. Second question then. How large should your t-value be if you want your p-value to be exactly zero? Again, you can pause the video if you want, and I'll show the answer on the next slide. So what t-value results in a p-value of 0? The answer is infinity, and of course that doesn't happen in practice. The t-distribution, just like the normal distribution, ranges all the way from minus infinity and infinity. And even at very large values of t, the probability density is not equal to 0. This is what I've shown here in the figure. I've shown the same figure on the left and on the right, but on the right I've zoomed in on the value of t equals 10. On the left, you might gain the impression that at a t-value of 10, surely the probability density will have reached zero. But if you zoom in, you'll see that, okay, the probability density is really small, 0.000041, but it is still not zero. And if you continue zooming in, you'll see that it never actually reaches zero. So a p-value of zero isn't possible. It never happens in practice. Nevertheless, in software, you will sometimes see something like p equals 0, 0.000. This is misleading because the p-value isn't zero. It just means that the p-value is smaller than the precision that your computer is using to compute it. What about two-sided testing? Suppose that we measure the body temperature of 100 students in a class, and we want to know, does their body temperature on average differ from 37 degrees? I don't know, maybe the class is extremely boring and body temperature is dropping, or maybe it's very exciting and the body temperature is increasing. So it could be higher, it could be lower, and that makes this a two-sided test. Say we calculated the t-value to be minus 0 0.835, so that means that the estimated mean was actually a little bit smaller than 37 degrees Celsius. Since this is a two-sided test, we want the chance of a result at least as extreme in either direction. So we also have to add the chance of observing a t-value of plus 0 0.835. Since this distribution is symmetric, we can simply do 2 times this 20.3% and end up with a value of 40.6%. That means that if the null hypothesis were true, then 40.6% of samples drawn from this population would have a t-value at least as extreme as the one that we observed. This is of course a very large chance, so we have very weak evidence against the null hypothesis and we don't reject it. Let's move on to how the two-sample t-test works. The two-sample t-test compares the mean of one group 
to that of another, and again divides it by the standard error. The null hypothesis for the two sample t-tests is that there is no difference in means. It can answer questions like, are men taller than women, which would be a one-sided test, or does smoking affect blood pressure, which would be a two-sided test. We can ask the question, are men significantly taller than women? We calculate that the men are on average about 1.85 meters and the women 1.72, so we can already fill in the numerator of the t value. How to calculate the standard error depends on whether we assume equal variance or not. If you'll recall, equal variance means that these two groups vary to the same extent from their respective means. So if we assume equal variance, then what we're saying is that there may be a difference in means, but the dispersion around the mean is the same for both groups. If we assume unequal variance, then there may be a difference in means, as well as a difference in the dispersion around their mean. This is a safer assumption, and you should use this if you're not sure. But if you can assume equal variance, it yields a more powerful test. To calculate the standard error then, for the equal variance test, we calculate a single pooled variance, and we do it as shown below. For the unequal variance, we calculate the standard error from two separate variances, which is known as Welch t-test. Now, since we're using two separate variances to calculate the standard error, this costs slightly more degrees of freedom. And that makes the calculation of the degrees of freedom a little bit more complex. Namely, instead of just calculating degrees of freedom as the sample size minus two for two estimated means, we have to perform Satterthwaite's approximation, as is shown on the right. Now, of course you don't have to know this calculation by heart, but what you should observe is that this involves a fraction, or actually several fractions, and because of that, the degrees of freedom can be non-integer. You'll see this in the output I've shown below. For the equal variance t-test, the degrees of freedom are a nice round 10, because we have 12 observations and we use two degrees of freedom. For the unequal variance t-test, it is a bit more difficult. We have 9.5537 degrees of freedom. You don't have to know this calculation, but you should realize that if you see this fraction, then that means that this is an unequal variance t-test. Next, we have the choice between independent or pair t-test. If you have distinct experimental units, as is the case with the example on height, where we have 12 different individuals, then you can use a regular two sample t-test. But let's say that you measure the blood pressure of six individuals before and after, then these are measurements from the same experimental units. And your value at the beginning of the experiment will somewhat affect the value after the experiment. So that means that measurements from the same experimental unit are correlated. And because of this, you would have to use a paired t-test. So what does a paired t-test actually do? Compare the following two tests. In the first, I perform a paired t-test using the before and after data. And in the second t-test, I first calculate difference of before minus after, and then I perform a one sample t-test with a value under the null hypothesis of zero. If you'll look closely, you'll see that these tests are identical. So that is the answer. A paired t-test is really just a one sample t-test for the differences from zero. Finally then, how do the non-parametric alternatives work? A t-test assumes conditional normality. So that means that given the group, the values follow a normal distribution. The normal distribution is symmetric, continuous, and has exponentially decreasing chances of further deviations from the mean. This assumption is reasonable when individual differences from the mean arise from a large sum of independent effects, which is known as the central limit theorem. For example, adult human height is affected by at least 697 variants of genes, as well as many environmental effects. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that, given someone's sex, country of origin, and perhaps several other variables, adult height follows an approximate normal distribution. When approximate normality is not a reasonable assumption, you can resort to less powerful tests that make no distributional assumptions. For the equivalent of a two sample t test, there is the Wilcoxon rank sum test, also known as the Mann Whitney U test. It tries to answer the question how likely is it that a randomly chosen member of one group is larger than a randomly chosen member of another group? And it does so by calculating the rank of each observation, 
and hence the name. With the example of height, we can calculate the rank as follows. The shortest female gets the rank of 1, and the tallest male gets the rank of 12. And if there are any ties, so people with the same height, then we calculate an average rank. Then, we sum the ranks for each group. So for the men, we sum the ranks to 55.5, and for the women, we sum the ranks to 22.5. We then calculate two test statistics, as the score minus the sample size times the sample size plus 1 divided by 2. And this yields us two values, 34.5 and 1.5. These two values are what you'll see in the output of R. Specifically, if you specify the Wilcoxon test using group 1 and then group 2, then R will report the test statistic of the first group. So in this example, if we do Wilcoxon test of males, females, then we'll show the test statistics for the males. And if we do Wilcoxon test of females, males, then we will show the test statistics for the females. For calculating the p-value, it will use the lowest of the two values. The exact calculation of the p-value for the Wilcoxon test is beyond the scope of this lecture. But if you're interested, you can check out the help file for the Wilcoxon distribution, or you can search for the Wilcoxon normal approximation, which is more commonly used. The paired version of the Wilcoxon test is called the Wilcoxon signed rank sum test. And to calculate it, you need the differences between the sample, the rank of the differences, and their sign, so positive or negative. For example, using the blood pressure data again, we have the before data, the after data, and first we calculate their difference. Then we calculate the rank of the absolute difference. So the smallest difference of minus 1 gets rank 1, and the largest difference of 25 gets rank 6. Then we compute the sign. So the negative difference of the first observation gets sign minus 1, and the rest all get sign 1, because they're positive. There are then two possible test statistics that you can calculate, the sum of the positive and the sum of the negative ranks. R returns the positive ranks as the test statistics in the output. So if you calculate it yourself, you'll see that it always matches. This test is called the Wilkinson signed rank sum test, and it is the same as a one sample Wilkinson test with mu equal to zero. Again, how this p-value is computed exactly is beyond the scope of this lecture. That concludes all the different types of t-tests discussed in this video. If you want to learn more, I recommend that you watch the video on multiple testing correction next. Thank you for watching.